Okay, our recording's going, so let's uh, let's start working through this. Okay, our agenda tonight, guys, is we're going to look at a number of things. We're going to do a refresher first on information security principles. We'll look at threats and issues, particularly in relation to the cloud. We'll look at the security considerations that we have when we're looking at the cloud. Then we'll go and review some of the very basic cloud security mechanisms. But where the real interest will come tonight is the last two the issues that we need to clarify with our cloud provider and some security tactics that we might want to use. So what we want to do first is we'll start going through. So what's information security? Now, everybody has a view of it. The users have this kind of view of it. It's something that kind of really gets in the road. Um, you know, IT puts it there to just stop people working. So this is not really the view that we should have. I mean, from an ICT point of view, our view is something dif different. Um, you know, if our firewall's down, stuff comes through, we've got all sorts of problems, we need to protect the network, we need to protect the users, we need to protect the resources. So in between these two, these two, two views, we have to come up with some solutions. And so we can define information security or InfoSec very simply as the protection of data against unauthorised access, right? And that kind of kind of sums it up really. However, a better definition would be the preservation of confidentiality, integrity, and, and the availability of information. In addition, such other properties such as authentic, authenticity, accountability, non-repudiation, reliability can also be involved. And this comes from the ISO 27001. Um, so there is a fair bit involved here. So this is a much more accurate view. But it's a view that looks at the particular needs of business, right? Although we can use this view and adapt it and, and use it to, to do our own personal security requirements. But it is really looking at the requirements of the enterprise. So we look at this as a series of goals. And, and the, we refer to this as the CIA triad. We have confidentiality. That's the first step in the triad. Uh, integrity of our data and availability. And what we're trying to do with these goals is we want to keep our data confidential. We want to ensure that its, that it's integrity is maintained, that is, it's not changed without being authorised, and that it's available when we need it. So for confidentiality, what we're looking at is that avoidance of unauthorised disclosure. We, we don't want people to access it if they're not allowed to see it. Um, and we do want people who are allowed to see it to access it and make the changes to it that they, they need to. To achieve that, we often use a technique called encryption. And this is the, the transformation of information using a secret, an encryption key, so that this transformed information, uh, which we call the ciphertext once it's transformed, can only be read by another secret, the decryption key, which in some cases can be the same as the encryption key. So if you look at the diagram, um, we have our, on the left hand side, we have our sender who has a message, he has a shared secret key, so he encrypts it. Once it's encrypted, he can send it across his communication channel. Our attacker, who is sitting in the middle trying to capture the message, can capture it and attempt to read it, but if he hasn't got the key, he can't. The recipient receives it. He also has a copy of the shared secret key, so he can decrypt that message and now he can read it. So that's one of the methods we would use to achieve confidentiality. We might also use a, a thing called authentication. This is determining the identity and the role that somebody has. So we can do this in a number of different ways, but it's usually based on a combination of things. So it can be based on something that the person has, like a smart card or a radio key fob, which has got a secret key, a certificate in it. It can be something that the person knows, such as a password, or it could be something that the person is, um, you know, a human with a fingerprint or uh, an iris scan. So we can authenticate using a number of different factors. And if you're using more than one factor, username and password is normally regarded as a single factor authentication. But as soon as you, excuse me, start to add fingerprints or um, smart cards and so on, you move into a world of multi-factor authentication. And that then starts to make 
the security of the authentication that much stronger. Once you authenticate, we now know who this person is, we then look at authorization. This is determining if this, this identified person is allowed access to certain resources, and this is based on, a, on an access control policy. And so this idea is to prevent anybody from tricking the system into letting them have access to resources that they're not they should not have access to. We also use physical security to establish these physical barriers to protect our, our compute resources. And these are things like um, locks on cabinets and doors, uh, putting computers in data centres, windowless rooms with thick walls, sound dampening materials, uh, and even Faraday cages, a, a building or a room that has a copper mesh through it um, so that you can't, you can defeat electromagnetic signals from entering or leaving. Uh, and of course you can now do that for your, your near field communication credit cards or debit cards, your passports and any other uh, NFC type item. So these are a number of ways that we would use to, to achieve confidentiality. We have to also have a characteristic of integrity and this is to ensure the property has not been altered in a way that's been un that is unauthorised. And so to achieve this, we do things like backups. We periodically back up and archive our data. We might run checksums, um, which is computing a function that maps the, the entire contents of the file to a numerical value. Right? Um, and this function depends on the entire contents. It's designed in a way that even a small change to the file, as it says here, just flipping a single bit, will give you a different output value. And if, it, if you run the checksum and it's not the same, then you know the file has been changed. And there are certain data correcting codes that we can use that detect small changes and can be they can then be automatically corrected. But that's our second principle, to ensure that the data it has integrity. Finally, in our triad, we want availability. And this is the, the characteristic that says the information is accessible and modifiable in a timely fashion by those who are authorised to do so. And so you do this by giving infrastructure that makes things available even in the event of physical challenges, uh, or you have redundancies, so computers and storage devices that serve as fallbacks. So in the case of physical protections, this is where you're starting to look at things like high availability, where you've got a number of computer resources that are in line across a load balancer, so that if one goes down, the other one's still available. Um, and same with um, com computational redundancies, the same sort of thing. You've got redundant devices there, redundant compute resources that can serve as a fallback in the case of a particular failure. So realistically what we want when we're looking at security is a layered approach. We don't rely on a single aspect to protect you, like a set of castle walls. We put in all the additional security measures. We put moats, bridges, strong gates, portocalluses, we add the boiling oil, etc. Um, you know, monsters in the moat if necessary. And then you allow entry through this controlled checkpoint, a gate. You also keep a good lookout and you put a, a nice elevated position there so you can see threats coming from a fair way away. So this is a very old idea, but it has enormous relevance to us right now, this layered approach to security. You don't rely on a single firewall to protect you. So what we do do is we start to put in things what we call, that we call choke points. And a choke point is a point where you, you, which you use to control and monitor access. So this allows you to concentrate your resources on a particular known point that has a security interest. It might be your access through a firewall. Um, it could be something else. But this point then can now be controlled and monitored. So this allows you to actually increase your level of security because you can now, as an organisation, focus on those areas that you have identified as areas of real concern. And you've probably done this out of a risk assessment and your security assessment. So having done this, you can now start to put these choke points in place so that you can monitor what's happening. And this, of course, once you're using choke points, instead of trying to protect everything, you're now protecting single points or a series of single points. So you reduce the chance of exposure because you're reducing the possibility of configuration errors. Right? So you're not trying to enforce many different controls in many different areas simultaneously. You reduce your security costs and probably increase your security effectiveness. So realistically with this, 
what we're looking at now, and as we go through this, we start to realise that security is really all around about risk management. Right? You're applying some controls, some security measures to reduce the risk of a threat occurring in your environment. And that risk is the level of impact on the organisational operations, which includes the mission, the functions, the image, the reputation, the assets, the individuals, um, given the potential impact of the threat and the likelihood of that threat occurring. So you need to be fairly realistic about what controls or measures you're going to apply, but in order to do that, you need to be aware of just exactly what risks you are facing. Um, and you also need to be aware that sometimes applying controls can create brand new risks. You know, so if we look at it this way, a strong, imposing, really thick, heavy gate can also be a weak point if the invaders have the right equipment, such as a battering ram, or find a way to bypass it, such as coming through the wall at the back. So a choke point can also be a single point of failure. Okay? So that's the thing to remember. It might be a great way to start to look at it, but don't rely on it as a single choke point as the be all and end all because that could also be a single point of failure. So James, I think we'll stop here now for a moment and we'll just see if there's any questions, um, give people a chance to sort of draw breath again and uh, and then we'll go on. Thanks Peter. Uh, I just have one question come in so far from Ujith uh, about um, several slides back. Does the method of uh, do backups apply to the CIA principle of availability or integrity? Integrity, really, because what you're looking at is you've got got a backup there, um, and I think that's what it said. We can just back up a little bit. Um, just a sec. Yeah, I think you had it in integrity. Yeah, so there it is there, achieving integrity, backups, um, the periodic archiving of data. So the whole idea there is if, if something has changed, um, if there's no other way to restore it, you can run a backup and restore from that backup and take you back to a known valid point. Okay, so yeah, so backups are part of, uh, of achieving the, the characteristic of integrity. Cool, thanks. Uh, that's the only question just for now. If anyone else has got any questions, feel free to put them up and I'll, we'll put them to Peter next time he uh, reaches a break. Okay, so now we start to look at some of the threats and issues. Now these are threats and issues to cloud services, so it might be issues or threats that you might not have considered. Um, abuse and nefarious use of cloud services, um, insecure interfaces and APIs, malicious insiders, shared technology issues, data loss, account or service hijacking, unknown risk profiles, denial of services. Um, these are the things that can cause us problems and these have been the, identified by the Cloud Security Alliance back in 2010 as the top threats to cloud computing. So, you know, the abuse of cloud services, and they were looking originally at things like spam and so on, but also using it for DDoS attacks. Um, they looked at, at the time, at interfaces and APIs and found that, you know, a lot of APIs that people were using were not secured terribly well, and some of the interfaces, once you got into an API, some of the services exposed were also not particularly secured. So you need to look at the APIs that you're going to use and see, are they secured, are they happening through a secure channel? The issue of malicious insiders occurs in both sides, both sides of the organisation. Is it a problem with the insiders in your own organisation or the insiders in the cloud provider? Um, and back in 2010, I mean, we were talking really five years ago here, this was a major drama and a major threat. It hasn't seemed to develop into one, and so I think if they rerun the... Um, the threat risk, threat analysis now, it would probably drop further down the table. Um, but we haven't seen much happen in the way of malicious insiders. Another issue that was caused there was shared technology. And this, this comes around the multi-tenanting technology because at that stage it was fairly new. And as all things are when they're fairly new, people look at them and say, oh, I don't know. You know, I don't know if this is going to work properly or not. And so there were some issues um, I think most of the providers now seem to have got their act together, but that still does not stop you from assessing that properly as a risk, risk assessment. Um, you need to look at that and decide whether or not what the, the, this particular provider is doing is going to be suitable for what you do. The questions of data loss or leakage um, is, is always an issue. 
Um, and what we're going to look at is how you're protecting your data, how you're protecting your data in transit to and from the cloud, how you're protecting your data within the cloud while it's at rest. So that we'll look at some of the, the tactics there further on in the thing. Um, we also have to look at the, the issues of account or service hijacking. Um, account hijacking we see fairly regularly um, and this is a known problem where people um, are using their account in an insecure way which or, or have fallen, fallen to a phishing attack and so they give up their account details or they have their identity hijacked so that their account is compromised. And once the account is compromised then possibly the service can be hijacked if, uh, if that, that particular account has access to it, particularly in an administrative role. So we need to think about that. And so as a result of that you might say well if I'm going to do um, an administrative interface, for example, into a cloud service, perhaps I'm going to put multi-factor authentication in place there so that not only have I got a username and a password, but I'm also going to have a multi-factor authentication profile there, which means there's going to be a third way uh, to authenticate. So that might be a, a way of, of running it. Um, there's the, pro, the, the unknown risk profile, where we, a risk we don't know about um, or haven't considered. And what we'll do tonight and next week is look at most of the well-known risks, but that still doesn't completely deny this particular problem. So there may still be a problem that you have and it may be related to the particular context around which you're working. So this needs to be investigated no matter what we do. And of course there's the old favourite, the denial of service, um, which can happen to anybody who's got a web presence. So that's what the Cloud Security Alliance sees as the top threats. Um, We'll have a look at the Australian Signals Directorate later and see some of the things that they look at um, and, um, and see some of the differences. Uh, we have some vulnerabilities and, and Baisong and Raman back in 2011 um, argued that the primary, the primary vulnerabilities in the cloud are things like eavesdropping, malicious, malicious attacks, outages and DDoS attacks, uh, experimental attacks against hypervisors through the use of shared resources and these unexplored, undiscovered vulnerabilities. So again, um, a lot of this hasn't been borne out. Some of it has. We've had some outages in AWS and Azure and Google. Um, we've, we've had some malicious attacks. Um, we've had attempts at eavesdropping, but that will happen virtually to, um, to anybody that has a website. Um, We've had some experimental attacks against hypervisors, and although, the, although the, these have been shown to be possibly effective in the lab, I don't know that we've actually seen one in real life. Um, I haven't been able to find any, any references to it. That doesn't say that one's occurred, but I haven't been able to find any references. And of course there are always the possibility of unexplored, undiscovered vulnerabilities, as we see with Patch Tuesday every, every month when Microsoft, amongst others, start patching uh, against a series of, of, of previously unexplored, undiscovered vulnerabilities. So the ASD, the Australian Signals Directorate, has also produced a number of publications that we can use. And their Cloud Computing Considerations document looks at how do we maintain availability and functionality? How do we protect our data from unauthorised access by third parties, other cloud consumers, rogue provider employers? And how do we go about handling security incidents? And so it gives a non-exhaustive but detailed list of various different security considerations. And we'll look at some of these now. I mean, at the end of, the, the end of this lecture, there is a link to this. It's a PDF document freely available so you can get on it, download it, and I highly recommend that you do and work your way through it. If you're looking at doing something in the cloud, this is a good starting point. So security considerations from the ASD, the Australian Signals Directory. Network security, how are you doing transfer of data, how are you doing firewalling, how are you doing security configuration. So that would be the first port of, excuse me, port of call. You look at the network security and everything that comes into it and you start to see what can I do here, how can I tie this up, how can I make this a bit more secure. The next step then is interface security and you look here at your APIs, your administrative interfaces, um, your user interfaces, updates and patching. So with your APIs if you're surfacing an API 
on the web uh, through a, you know an IAAS service or a PAAS service, then or even a, an SAAS service, then you need to make sure as a developer uh, provider of services that your API is secure and is secure both from your side and secure for your clients to use. The same with your administrative interface. This is where you are going to access the, the cloud in order to administer the services that you have rented from the particular provider. So your access into that administrative interface should be controlled. It should be, it, you should ensure that you have good security there. You should ensure that you can def, definitely guarantee the authentication of people logging in and then you lock it down so they can only do certain things. The same with your user interfaces. Um, you might have a public user interface. You might have a corporate user interface. Now, the public interface could well be open for anybody to use, but the corporate interface may well be locked down so that it's possibly even linked to your uh, internal LDAP directory so that you can provide perhaps a single sign-on interface for your users to log on to the cloud. No matter which way you do it, you need to look at how do I do that security, how do I lock this thing down. Then you need to look at the updates and patches. So particularly if you're running IAAS, uh, you are responsible for updates and patches. And so you need to think about how I'm going to do this, when am I going to do this, how often am I going to do this, and so on. You need to think about authentication. And so you have two parts here. Authentication, that is identifying the user and making sure they are authorised to be on there. And then authorization, which is giving them access to the resources that you want to have them access, want them to have access to. So there are two parts and you need to consider it. The next step, of course, is data security. And this is where you start to think about, do I use cryptography? Do I encrypt my data in transit, that is, to and from the cloud? Do I encrypt it at rest while it's in storage on the cloud? Um, how long is it going to take to decrypt and use? How long is it going to take to encrypt and send away? Um, and so on. So you need to think about that. You need to think about that in terms of redundancy as well. How am I going to, have I got redundant data stores there that may be perhaps living in another region that, um, you know, if this region is affected, then I still have the data in a redundant copy over there. You also need to think about backup and recovery. Um, now, I know there were some issues uh, were raised and were certainly raised in ITC 561, which is the, the CSU version of this particular course, the full course. And, uh, and some of the guys in there raised, particularly in relation to SAAS services, and said, well, why should I do backup? You know, if, for example, I'm using Office 365, Microsoft backs it up. If I'm using Google Docs, Google backs it up. If I use, you know, uh, Outlook.com, Microsoft backs it up. If I use Gmail, Google backs it up. Why should I bother about backing it up? The trouble is, Microsoft and Google will probably back it up and hold that backup for about a fortnight perhaps, um, and there's no guarantee that you'll be able to get back everything you want. So if you're going to run this in the cloud, you've got to decide, is this data critical? How long is it critical? What's your RTOs and RPOs? Um, how do I do this? How do I? How far back do I need to go? So do I need to run my own backup? Um, and then if I need to recover it, can I recover it? Where do I put it? Where do I run it? How do I archive the data? Um, so it might be, uh, let's say it's email data, and I might decide everything older than 12 months I'm going to archive, but allow people to pull back as they want. So how do I archive that? Um, where do I store that archive data? Um, do I put it on some long-term storage, something like AWS Glacier, where it's you know, very, very cheap, but it might take a couple of days to pull it back? And what about disposal of the data? Yes, I can go, you know, delete, and that deletes the data, but there's still copies left on the disk. Um, so if we want to, you know, or if you're even moving from the uh, from the provider, how can you guarantee that your data has been totally scrubbed? And so this is something that you would need to talk about with the provider and say, you know, if I want to delete data, then how do I ensure that section of the disk, that section of, um, of the storage that I've, I've used is fully scrubbed so that there is no possibility of recovering that data? We move to virtualization, so we look at, you know, how is this isolated? You know, are there any particular vulnerabilities in the hypervisor model that they're using? What's the possibility of data leakage between a VM on, you know, between VMs on the same cluster or even cross-cluster? Um, is there issues around VM identification? Can I see that? Is there a possibility of a cross-VM attack? So you need to 
talk to the uh, to the provider about this, you also need to do a little bit of research to see you know if that's on a on a VMware vSphere um, instance, for example. You know what's the possibility of a cross VM attack? If it's sitting on a Zen instance, what's the possibility? If it's sitting on Hyper V or KVM, what's the possibility of a cross VM attack or some sort of hypervisor you, you vulnerability? So you need to be able to know that so that you can talk to the provider, but also so that you can do a proper risk assessment around it. So as you see, all this stuff that we're talking about now kind of leads into next week's work where we start looking at the risk assessments as well, because this is basically the start of deciding your risk assessment. And then you have another couple of other things, and this is where you start to look at things like governance. How do I control the data? How do I control security? What do I do about change control? What do I do about provider locking? Am I locked into the provider if I put all my data there? So, for example, if I go to Office 365 and Outlook.com, am I now locked into Microsoft for this, or can I pick it up and move to Google or Oracle or somebody else? Right? Um, how do I go for compliance? You know, what does the SLAs do? What do I do in a case for loss of service? What do I what do I do for auditing? Um, is the service conformity in direction with the, what we want. You know, are we going to? Do we get conformity for our service? What about legal issues? What, where's the data actually located? What if there is a requirement for e-discovery for a, for a legal challenge or or a legal court case? Um, in which case you may be served with a summons for e-discovery, so that the other party's lawyers can then go through your documents to find something. Um, is there issues of provider privilege and are you subject to legislation and regulation? Um, and if that's the case, how is it affected by your data location, your provider privilege, your governance, and your compliance? So these are questions and considerations that you need to look at. And I've only covered a few of them here. I mean, there is quite a lot more, particularly if you go through that ASD document. It looks at them in a great deal of detail. Right. There's also uh, at the bottom of this page, page 21 of the um, of the presentation, a reference to um, you know a, a quantitative analysis of current security concerns. So that's another another one that, that talks about how do you do that. But if you look at the ASD document, that is probably a really good place to start because it will give you a lot more information and a lot more ideas about where issues could be. So James, we might stop there now and start to think about, you know, are there any questions? Very good. Uh, thanks. There are a few questions about the security considerations. Um, you spoke about backups of uh, SaaS providers in particular and how long they keep your backups for. Uh, Nitin has asked, uh, if one is only using SaaS providers, what security considerations are the most important? Well, I suppose it really depends on a couple of things. One is what's the SaaS provider or who is the SaaS provider? What is the service you're using? What data are you putting into it? Uh, how critical is that data to your business? Um, and see, what we're talking about here is you, you're really starting to look at a risk assessment. right? And all these security considerations now form part of that risk assessment. So you'd go through first and say, okay, these are the things I think could, could be an issue here. Once you identify them, now you go through and assess them one by one, which we'll look at next week. So this is the first step, the information security assessment, and it leads us to that risk assessment. So I probably can't really answer his question all in one hit today. I can give him this answer, and then if we ask the same question again next week, we can then work through that risk assessment to show how that all fits. Does that help? Yeah, totally. Thanks. Um, and additionally, I guess, talking about risk, we'll, we'll cover this a lot next week. Craig has asked, can you define risk? I don't know if that's meant... Um, let's leave that one. Question. <laughs> yeah, that, that could start an argument. Let's leave, let's, let's leave that one to next week. <laughs> cool. Uh, just quickly, Andrew has asked, you mentioned the, t the um, acronyms RPO and RTO. Can you please define what those are? Recovery time objective and recovery point objective. So what is the recovery time 
that you you the time for you, you can live without the data um, before you have to have it recovered before your business suffers and what is the recovery point at what point in the backup do you need to go be able to go back to in order to do that recovery so these are two quite technical terms um, that mean quite a lot in, the, in a business continuity plan and so what you'd be doing is, is going through each of your data sets and trying to determine RTO and RPO for each of them so that you can determine you know, where you put them in the storage tier, uh, how you, what the priority they get for recovery, uh, the priority they get for backup, um, which tier they go into. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's something actually I've just finished doing in, in our organisation um, where we spent a month or so um, doing that and it's still in process where you know we've um, we will go through that for another probably another month or so if, if James is on he'd probably agree with me um, and um, we'll be looking at finally coming out with a new uh, new storage tier at the end of it but also a new direction and a new set of guidelines for our backup and recovery because we'd now be looking at the tiers and the the RTO and RPO as defined by the business and their requirements. Excellent. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Andrew has just asked a question. Um, what's your opinion? You spoke of APIs. What's your opinion of API uh, integration providers? I don't, I don't know if there's the best term for this, but have you heard of a company called uh, Zapier? I haven't, actually. Um, but, I, Andrew, what I'd do if I were you, can you put that question into the forum, and I'll do a bit of research tomorrow and throw an answer into there. Um, I haven't heard of the company. Um, I have heard of API providers and, and integrators. Um, I haven't done a lot of work with them, or well, I haven't done any work with them, and I have not le read a lot about them, but I'll certainly do a bit of research and um, give you an answer tomorrow if you want to throw that into the forum for me. That's excellent. Andrew says, sure. That would right. be a good one to discuss on the forum, actually. Yep. There's a, a lot of extra security considerations to go with that. Yeah. Oh, God, yes. Um, uh, Dan has just asked, uh, when you listed updates and patches, why do they come under interface security? Well, um, I suppose it's just kind of been dumped in there because of the appropriate place to put them. <laughs> um, but really what they are is they come in under IAAS security because, you know, under, under an IAAS model, basically you're getting from the, the operating system up. Um, so all that infrastructure underneath is being provided to you, you're taking over at the operating system level, so you've got to patch that operating system and any applications that sit there, um, that sit on top of it, in order to provide the service that you're going to provide to your own clients or to other clients. So um, that's where I see patching and, up and updating coming in. To a lesser Certainly, degree, I guess so. yeah, to a lesser degree of the same in, in um, PWS, uh, you know, if you're, you're running a database, but Usually in PWS, the provider is going to patch the database and update the database as it goes, and you're just running the database per se. So, um, but that might be a, a matter of, uh, of discussion over the SLA, and you might have uh, you might have an, an opinion on that with the SLA, over the SLA with the provider, and come to some agreement about who does what. It's the shared responsibility yeah, totally. boundary. Right? Um, it can move a little bit. Um, I think there's probably a good example this week. I don't know if I'm taking it too literally about um, updates and patches being under interface security, but uh, WordPress had yet another patch this week for, a, um, well, I guess it, everyone had to update and patch their WordPress installations because um, there was a cross-site scripting bug and one, one in which uh, malicious code could be put into to comments, which would be, part of the interface, the user interface, yeah. uh, which would hack the sites. Yeah, so it's, it's, you know, it's not just a, um, an operating system issue, it's also a, an application issue and, and can even be an API issue, a bit less, less common to be an API issue, but can be. Mm. Uh, sorry, there's, there's probably, <laughs> there's several more questions here, but we'll just cover just one one more for now, if that's all right with everyone, yep, we'll get the, yep. the webinar moving back on. Um, I'll just grab one here from, from Rohan. Uh, would you seek to find out what is um, the vendor's ability to handle handle customer churn when you are doing the POC? Uh, I don't actually know. What's, what's POC stand Proof for? Proof of concept. 
Oh, yeah. So yes, um, we're actually doing or just getting ready to start a POC, a proof of concept um, SAAS operation. Um, and what we were what we're looking at is, you know, how long are we got to be locked in on it for? Um, if we want to change users or add users, remove users, and so on. And we've spent a bit of time talking with the provider around that. So yes, I would see that as being a normal a normal negotiation thing with the provider. Um, and even though, you know, if you go to the AWS site or the Microsoft Azure site or the Google site and they give you an SLA, um, SLAs can be negotiated, right? And don't be afraid to uh, to ring Google or Microsoft or uh, AWS and say, guys, I need to talk to somebody. I want to get a service and I want to talk about the SLA. And they usually will be quite happy to discuss the SLA and negotiate it with you. Excellent. All right, thanks for that. I think right. uh, we'll okay. move on for now. All right, well, well, we'll push on now and then we can grab some more questions at the end. Okay, so what we're going to do now, guys, we're going to start and look at some of the, the basic cloud security mechanisms. Um, I've cut this down tonight because there's quite a few, but I just want to look at the real basic ones. PKI, Public Key Infrastructure, which basically covers encryption, decryption, digital signatures. Uh, identity and Access Management, that is the identification, authentication, authorization of users, cloud-based security, and then hardened virtual server images. So PKI, it's a, a set of hardware, software, people, policies, procedures that you need to manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates. So from a Cryptography point of view, a PKI, a public key infrastructure, is an arrangement that binds certain public keys with respective user identities by means of a certificate authority, a CA. So, you know, if you want to get a CA, you want to get a certificate in order to run a public key infrastructure, you might go to a, um, a trusted CA, somebody like VeriSign, um, and say, I want to buy a certificate. And you buy a certificate from them which where they have gone through a procedure which identifies you and they write that into that certificate. It then is published. You can then, you then have two certificates, the public key and the private key. And so the CA guarantees effectively your trustworthiness during a transaction. So if you've gone to, you know, uh, Amazon, for example, to purchase uh, a book for your Kindle, if you look at the browser, Bar, you'll see there's a heart, there's usually a, a, a lock key in it. If you click on the lock key, it'll show you who the certificate belongs to. Now, it might be from VeriSign or somebody like that, and it'll talk about Amazon um, and say, you know, they've purchased, they are the, the trustee that is the owner of this key. We can trust that they are who they say they are. Okay, and so this is the enabler for us for encryption and dig digital signatures. So this is basically how it works. Right? Um, if we have um, CA, the root at the top there, they sign the certificates and they go down to subordinates. We can publish those to a directory. Right? The directory can validate a sender certificate, which goes down to the data recipient. Right? Um, we can also configure a user with a copy of the certificate plus some private keys. And the certificate can then send data to that data recipient encrypted. Right? That, that now allows us to decrypt, by using these keys, we can now decrypt that encrypted data to read the message after it's passed across the public internet in a safe manner. So that's the idea of the public key infrastructure, and that's a very, very quick, broad flick over it. Right, so basically a digital encoding system. We want to use this to protect the confidentiality and the integrity of our data. So we encrypt a message using a cipher, an algorithm which transforms our text, our data, into cipher text that can't be accessed by anyone except the authorised party. So here we've got the sender on the left-hand side has a set of text or data. He wants to encrypt it, and he encrypts it using the recipient's public key. Okay. So once it's encrypted, that cipher text can now be sent across the internet, um, and everybody is sure that it can't be intercepted, um, or if it is intercepted, it can't be read but received by the recipient who uses his private key to decrypt it, and he can then read the, the text or the data that was in the, in the message. So a digital signature then 
is a means of providing this data authenticity and integrity through authentication. Right? So we might assign a, a digital signature to a message prior to the transmission. And if the, the message is changed or modified, then that signature is rendered invalid. And so if you receive a message with a digital signature, it's evidence that the message is the same as the one created by its rightful owner. So it's created using the, the, the owner's private key. So here's how it works. So user A uh, wants to send something to user B. So he has some data. He runs it through a hash algorithm. Um, it gets a hash value. And he uses his private key to decrypt, to encrypt it. Okay. So that now is encrypted, ciphertext. He can send that to user B. User B takes that data and does two things with it. Firstly, he runs through the, uh, a, a hash algorithm to produce a hash value. And he also takes that encrypted ciphertext and runs it through the public key of user A to produce a hash value. If the two hash values mat, match, the data is valid. And the ownership, we guarantee then, is user A. Okay, so that's basically the process of using a digital signature. From the next thing we need to look at is the identity and access management system. Now there's four components to this. There's the authentication process, which is the process of determining, determining whether somebody or something is who or what they claim to be. And so we authenticate users into a system before access. We might also authenticate devices. Right? So it can be users and devices generally users, but usually within a network, um, an internal network, uh, a corporate network using an LDAP uh, server such as Active Directory, you'll also encrypt and uh, authenticate your devices. The next step then is, is authorization, and this is the process of determining that that identified user is now able to access the resources that they want. And so this looks at the relationship between the identity the access rights and the availability of the resource. And so normally in an LDAP directory such as Active Directory, this is managed by groups. So if you're in a certain group, the, that group has access to certain, has access rights to a certain resource. If you're not in the group, you can't get to it. it, it it's that kind of simple. And we can do the same thing now in the cloud because you can set up user groups within the cloud as part of your IAM system, your identity and access management system, and give users who are in those groups access to certain resources. There is also a process of user management. This is where you enrol or unenrol users. You manage the access groups. You might have to change passwords, set privileges, and so on. Right? Uh, this process of enrolling and unenrolling is also known, it's becoming more and more known now, as onboarding and offboarding. Right? So you onboard somebody when you bring them in and enrol, excuse me, enrol them, and you offboard somebody when you unenrol them and take them out of the system. And that's very important because one of the things that that uh, systems usually do is forget to unenrol users, and so users may remain in the system as active users for a long time after they've actually left organisations. Um, and if they're smart or canny or you know, just uh, strangely interesting, then they can properly log back in and continue to access things, uh, even though they may have left. And then the final process then is credential management, and this is the, the process of issuing a specific set of credentials to an identity. So in most cases, that might be a username and password. Um, and it also maintains the life cycle of that credential. So, you know, you might uh, say username and password, the password's valid for 60 days, and then it's got to be got to be changed and it can't be any of the last five passwords that have been used. And so that's the process of credential management. If you're using a multi-factor authentication, then that adds into it. You might have an RSA token or something similar that adds into it. So there's a particular hash value that comes from the RSA server that says this hash value determines the, um, the credentials for this particular user. And that's the, the hash value that will be used to determine if the credential given is, uh, is valid. We also have cloud-based security groups. Now, this is an area that a lot of people don't consider, uh, but should. So you can increase your data protection in the cloud 
by segmenting your resources. So you can use your policies and you can set up policies in the cloud um, to, divide, to find logical cloud-based security groups. Each can contain a separate cloud resource. So for example, on AWS, the EC2 security groups prevent other instances from talking to your instances. So if you've got two or three different um, security groups, you can prevent the security group A from talking to the resources owned by security group B or security group C and vice versa. So effectively, an EC2 security group in AWS defines a virtual private cloud. Okay? And that's a really interesting thing to think about because you can now start to really tie down who gets access to which resources and provide some isolation around those resources. So each group you can apply different security policies to. You can allocate different VMs to virtual machines to each group. So for example, you could have public facing VMs in one group, internal facing VMs in another group, um, production VMs, UAT, user acceptance testing, or dev groups, development groups, each in their own VPC, and any other groups as you might need to run your particular instance. And so if somebody gets access to and manages to, to hack into one of these VPCs, then they are contained within the VPC. They can't get out of that virtual private cloud to the other resources. Right? So if you've got a case of intrusion or you've got a security breach, you are containing the process and holding it in place. So you need to think about the use of cloud-based security groups. You also need to think about hardened virtual server images. And this probably is more for an on-premise services uh, instance than anything else because most of the cloud providers now are going to create hardened VMs. And basically, a hardened VM image is created from a template that applies a security policy as part of the build process. And so this gives you a VM that's more secure. It's pre-configured for security and it's up to date with all the current patches. So, you know, in the, the image here, um, we supply the um, we apply the security policies. Um, they come out of the resource management system, and we do things like close the unnecessary service ports, disable unnecessary services, uh, disable unnecessary internal root accounts, disable guest access to system directories, uninstall redundant software, establish memory quotas, etc., etc., etc. So you'll have a different set of hardening processes for each type of server that you're running. You know, if you're running um, System Setter uh, 2012, uh, for example, and, and the 2012, Server 2012 images will have one set of hardened image processes. If you're running uh, Red Hat Enterprise you know, 6, then you'll have a different set which will achieve the same thing. Uh, if you're running SUSE, then it's another set which will run, which will do, achieve the same thing, and so forth. So the idea of the hardened virtual server image is to prevent attacks against the VM itself, okay? And you do this automatically, so as a new VM is run up, you don't have a system admin required to go through and harden it. The policy is applied, and it happens automatically. It's just bang, there it is. As the VM comes up, it's already hardened. Okay, James, this is another good spot to stop, because then we've got the last stretch uh, where we talk about the, the things we want to look at. Over to you, cool. Yep, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, Greg, Greg has asked, so, uh, could you discuss security issues associated with data sovereignty? Ooh, interesting question. Um, and we could spend another two hours here uh, on that. Let's throw this one into the forum. I don't want to put you off, Greg. I think it's a really valid and interesting question, but it's going to go on for some time. So let's put this one into the forum where we can take it on for some time as required, okay? That's a good idea. Um, yeah, if you could please, Greg, that that would be a, a good big discussion that we could have. I know the company's It'll be a very for, interesting one, and, and a lot of people... Yeah, very, very hesitant to um, put their data in the cloud, less so these days. Yeah, but it's, it's an area where we need to think about. And, um, yeah, let's put that in there, because I've got some ideas that, you know, might help, um, and there are some other possible solutions to the problem. But let's put it in there and discuss it. it it's one that will probably go f right through next week as well. Um, yeah, 
totally. Uh, Jason's just asked, is it possible to restrict access at a MAC address level or, or relevant when it comes to a cloud service? Um, normally don't try to do it at MAC, MAC address level. Um, you're normally looking at bringing them in at an application level. Um, for This is for users. Um, so, you know, you're trying to bring it up at that, that higher level rather than, than um, down at the hardware. You've got to remember, even at IAAS, you're not down at the MAC address level, you're above it, you're at the operating system level. Because underneath that is controlled by the provider. Right? So you're working for the operating system up, the MAC address lives in the hardware. So it's not going to be an area that you're going to play with because if you think back to that shared responsibility boundary, that is going to be all locked down by the provider. Um, you're going to get access to the resources that live underneath you in the operating system, but you're not going to be able to control or make changes to those resources. So I don't think you'd be able to do anything in the way of a MAC address in, in the cloud. I agree. Thanks for that. Uh, just uh, one last question and an administrative question. Craig has asked, what is this forum you speak of? <laughs> Good question. I'll field that one. Okay, well done. Um, that indicates we're not doing our job uh, properly in uh, directing you to it. Is uh, whenever you receive an email uh, reminding you of the webinars each week, uh, and you get a, a, a login link to uh, this go-to webinar service, there's another link that goes to the learn.itmasters portal, which is our our website learn.itmasters.edu.au. Um, it's a learning management system and it's got all the course materials on it. Uh, there's a discussion forum there, one of the first links on the page when you go to the cloud models uh, short course on there. Uh, if you jump into the discussion forum, you'll see a bunch of uh, threads already, people asking questions and, and making discussions. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a great plus, place to ask anything more in depth or anything that we can't get to tonight. And it's actually a great place to find it information because there's been some fabulous questions asked. Um, mm. and, um, a couple have stretched me a little bit, and I've learned more from from this course than I've, I have for a long time. So well done, guys. This is great. Absolutely. Uh, Richard's also just said if people are doing their quizzes, they should see the forum there too, uh, and vice versa. Yep. So. Yep. So please do your quiz. We'll remind you again at the end. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. We'll get back onto it now. Okay. All right, let's move on. So, whoops, wrong way, sorry. Okay, so initial steps. What are we going to do? Make sure you understand what you want to do and how you're going to do it. So think about this. How will the loose structure of the cloud affect the security of your data? Do you know how you're going to transmit and store the data? Do you know how the application handles the data? So this might be some areas you've got to do a bit of research before. Ensure that you've got transparency about the cloud security architecture. So having picked your provider, um, you need to find out who does their regular security audit. Can you get information on their audit results? If your organisation wants to run an audit against the data, can that be, excuse me, can that be done? And so you may need to be talking about them talking to them about this, sorry. You need to think about reinforcing your internal security approach. So have you adopted a layered security approach? Because now, if you're providing a link from your internal system out to the cloud, you know, in a hybrid type approach, um, have you actually provided a, a, a way that an attacker, if they manage to intrude into the cloud, could get back into your internal system? So now you need to think about this layered security. You need to think about strengthening user authentication and access controls. Um, will your internal security controls mesh with the cloud controls? Will your internal security policies mesh with what's happening in the cloud in the provider that you with the provider that you want to use? These are things that you will need to think about. You need to consider the legal implica implications here. What laws and regulations affect your data? You should know this, um, but it's surprising how often we don't realise as things change what new laws come into play. I mean, have you thought about what happens to your data in relation to the new Privacy Act in Australia? And I know that only affects the guys in Australia, but if you look at the, the, the rest of you who are overseas, think about what's been happening in your country and 
how is that affecting the data, the, legal, the laws, the regulations, how is that going to affect that? What are the security, privacy, legal and risk implications of moving this data to the cloud? How critical is that data to your organisation? So around that, you need to make some decisions and consider the implications. You also need to pay attention. Are you actually monitoring the developments and changes in your cloud provider? Do you know what's going on? Are you monitoring uh, developments and changes in cloud technology and practice? Uh, are you monitoring cloud security and risk implications? Are you monitoring what's happening in the way of cloud research? So, guys, what this means is, you know, are you actually keeping up with the changes? Are you reading things like ZDNet, uh, various different other cloud or, um, or trade magazines to see what's happening? Are you a member of the ACM or the IEEE or, or, or anything like that and getting information from them? Because this is where you're going to find out what these developments, what these changes are, and as a result, find out where security and risk implications start to come out of. So you need to think about this regular research and reading program. You can't just kind of live in a vacuum and say, oh, yeah, I've done the, I've done the AWS risk assessment, so I'm right. We don't have to worry about that again. You need to keep reading and researching. So you have to pay attention. So we have a number of issues we need to clarify before we go there. This is the stuff you need to do first. And so I've broken these down into about five or six steps. The first one is user access. And these are questions. Can you integrate your current LDAP directory with the cloud server? So you, let's say you've got Active Directory, like I have at work. So if I want to do, you know, let's say I want to move to Office 365 and get rid of the on on-premise exchange and SharePoint and so on, um, and drop the you know the the, the distribution of um, of Office 2010 and move to Office 365. So provide all this out of the cloud. How am I going to do that? Can I integrate my current Active Directory with the cloud service? Uh, is there a way to do that? Uh, what can I do about provisioning? Can I onboard, offboard users? Can I enrol them and enrol them? Is multi-factor authentication available? Can I do delegated administration of the users? Can I do single sign-on? That's SSO, single sign-on. Um, is that available for access to applications? And if so, how is it configured, authenticated and authorised? Right? Um, and particularly for users, a thing like SSO, the single sign-on makes it very easy. You click on the icon, bang, you're in, it happens. So, you know, this may be one of the requirements you have that, you know, assess a single sign-on uh, mechanism has to be in place. What about access control? How are you going to do that? You're going to, you know, we know AWS, for example, has user groups. You can set up virtual private clouds. What about Office 365? Do they do that? I don't know. You know, you need to check that out. Will they allow you to implement existing enterprise policies? Um, can you get specific information on the provider and who he hires and how he oversights his privileged administrators and the controls over their access to your information. So you would need to know that for your auditing points of view. Um, is your provider willing to submit to external audits and security certifications? Um, and some will and some won't. So you're going to have to look at that. Um, where's your data located? Do you know where it will be located and processed? So that raises the question of which jurisdiction will it be subject to? And f from that, what are the privacy, regulatory and compliance issues? And so it may well be if you've got data that's not supposed to move offshore uh, in Australia, you might say, well, I'm going to put my data, that's using AWS again as an example, I'm going to use a, uh, an S3 instance in, uh, in the Sydney data centre, uh, redundant with an S3 instance in the Melbourne data centre. But I can, because the data's here, I can actually run the uh, the application on a HA instance across the, the Southeast Asia, that is the Singapore data centre, and the Australian data centre. So now, you know, if one of them goes down, I've still got access to the other. So, you know, you don't you, you can mix mix and match a little here. Um, what about data segre segregation? What's being done to segregate your data from other people in the same S3 bucket or whatever whatever bucket it's going into? Um, do you have proof that encryption schemes are deployed and are effective? Um, how are you going to encrypt your data? Why are you going to encrypt your data? How are you going to segregate? It's really the question you need to ask here. 
What about disaster recovery? Can your provider completely restore your service and all your data if everything goes down? And then the big question, how long will it take? And that's probably the $64 question, really, or the million-dollar question these days. Um, what about investigations? Will the provider give a contractual commitment to support specific investigations, such as the discovery phase of a lawsuit? Um, can they verify that they've actually done this before? And I would not assume that it can be done if there's no evidence of it having been done. So you need to think about that. Um, Long-term viability. How do you get your data back if the provider fails? Uh, how do you get your data back if the provider is taken over? What about if they go bankrupt? Can you get your data back? Will your data be in a format that you can easily import into another application? So these are some questions that you need to think about before you go diving in. And so these form part of the problem that you would look at as part of your risk management approach. Then for the BCP, your business continuity plan. How are you going to integrate cloud services into your BCP? Because your enterprise will have a BCP, a business con continuity plan, or they might call it disaster recovery plan. Um, so how will now using the cloud affect the strategy you use for disaster recovery for BCP? Right? So you need to think about that because that can actually change it dramatically. Um, and that now needs to be considered and probably at a strategic level, which means you're going to be starting to talk with the CIO, the CEO, the CFO and so on and get the executive team involved in this because it suddenly changes parts of the strategic direction of your enterprise. So now you've got to have some serious, serious, serious conversations with the guys at the C level. Then you have to think about the exit strategy. So what if you want to disengage? How do you get out? How do you get your data back? Where do you do it? What format will it be in? Can you put it back on in, on premise? Uh, or have you got rid of all the stuff on premise and you've no longer got the data storage there to hold it? Right? So you need to think about the exit strategy and you need to think about it well before you enter the cloud. You need to think about how do I get out of it? So the next steps. Um, we need to you plan your security tactics. You feed these clarification issues into your risk assessment. You start preparing a cloud governance strategy and you continue to research. Okay, now originally this is where I was going to stop it. And then I thought, no, we really need to take this on a little bit further. We need to talk about tactics. So here is a little bit about some tactics. And these are the tactics I would recommend, the security tactics I'd recommend that you use. Um, use security groups and define virtual private clouds. Right? It enhances your security. Create demilitarised zones and a private network within the VPC, particularly if you've got a public facing one. Create security groups for each compute instance. Use a jump server, and if anybody's not sure what a jump server, it's a hardened monitored device that spans two security zones. So you use a jump server to access your VPCs, um, and you would normally configure this so that you use SSH to get to specific IP addresses, and it's accessible only from specific IP addresses, and it must use multi-factor authentication. And so you would use these, these jump servers particularly for administrative access. So if you're getting through onto console access on an IAAS instance, or, uh, or similar on a PAAS instance, um, or to your administrative console uh, overall within the cloud provider, I'd be doing it through a jump server using multi-factor authentication for each of your administrators and I'd be restricting the number of administrators who can do it. So that's security tactics I would use there. The second one, second level of security tactics I would use is restrict that SSH access to the jump box with, with security groups. So you tie the jump box down pretty heavily. Use a host-based IDS, an intrusion detection system. Use a central log server so you can keep effects of the logs, but don't forget to check them. Um, it's amazing the number of people who have a log server uh, and all the logs go in there daily, but nobody ever ever goes to have a look. Um, and so if there is an attack um, and it's been picked up by the IDS, um, then um, nobody knows. You need to check the logs. If you've got any sensitive data, encrypt the volumes. Um, run alerts on application errors and do regular internal and external vulnerability scans. Guys, there we go. Um, that's the quick look at security. There's a number of things I'd recommend that you read. 
Firstly, the Amazon Web Services overview of security processes, quite a good one. Um, Amazon AWS security best practices, we'll give you some more. Um, the Defence Signals Directorate, it's now the Australian Signals Directorate, um, cloud computing security considerations. And then the Cloud Standards Consumer Council in 2012 put out security for cloud computing, 10 steps to ensure success. All of those are publicly available. The links are there. Download them. Have a look. There's two uh, videos I've put there for you. Um, one on basic computer security principles, because it's amazing how much we all think we know it, and occasionally we need to be reminded of it. So it's, it's always good to go back for a refresher. And then the other one is the Cloudcast, which talks more specifically about cloud computing security, and that one's worth looking at. And of course, guys, do the quiz. James, over to you. Good day. Uh, just quickly, uh, Chris has said, I've got a question not related to this week. Each time I log in to do the quiz, it says I have quizzes due and lists every week. Uh, I've done and passed every week. Um, I'm not quite sure on that one myself. I'm not sure if anyone else is seeing that, that same issue um, or if there's a, a problem with uh, the, the submission individually from Chris's ones. I've made a note, Chris, to, to look into that myself and I'll let you know. I'll post on the forum um, saying whether or not that's something that's just, yep, other people are saying they've got the same issue. Well, I know every it's time... Just, um, I know every time I log into the, to the Learn IT site, it tells me I've got quizzes to do, but I thought since I wrote them, it's probably not a good idea that I actually do them. Well, you know all the answers. Well, that's true. I mean, <laughs> you better get them all right. It would be woeful if I started to get them wrong, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, so a few people have said they've got the same thing. I'll look into okay. that, guys. Um, but if you've got the, um, if it says, you know, the result comes up, you've passed the quiz, then... That's recorded that's in the all system, and, and that's all you need to do. Um, just a, a few comments and, and questions from people. Um, Richard says uh, one of his clients hired a third-party pen tester to test against his cloud service. Mm -hmm. He says Amazon does allow this if you let them know about it. Oh, yes, but let them know first. Um, otherwise, they regard it as a, as a fair dinkum real attack. So, Fair enough. and then, then the fun starts. Now, if you're going to do pen testing, and I have done the same, um, you advise Amazon, there is a form you fill in, um, you've got to tell them the IP address you're going to hit, the IP address you're hitting from, um, and exactly what you want to do, and why you want to do it. There's usually no problem with it, um, providing you let them know about it. I think they normally need about three or four days' notice, but I'm not quite sure of the exact amount of notice. We gave them two weeks, um, they were very happy with that, so... You know, but I think it's three or four days is the minimum. That's that's really good info. It's good to know. I wonder what it's like between different cloud providers and what their their policies are and what the the turnaround times on on letting them know are. Well, I don't know. I, I, we've only used AWS so far. We're just starting off some stuff with Azure, um, so we're just in the process of starting to get set up. So uh, we're certainly not in a position to do any pen testing yet. Um, but I'll. You know, I'll be doing that with, with the Azure one as well, uh, probably in a month or so. So, um, and then we'll know. Oh, cool. It, especially Google would be the interesting one because they're obviously quite known for being quite automated. Uh, very, there's, there's a lot less of a, a human on the other end a lot of the time when you're using their services because they're so... Well, for a long time, they've been the classic cloud provider. Yeah, and... and automated. I'm, but again, I think they, they run exactly the same deal as Amazon or Azure in that you know there is a, a form you fill in, you let them know where it's coming from, what it's aimed at, and, um, and they'll sit there and monitor it. Very good. Thanks. Very informative. Uh, Linda's asked, is, is the cloud safe for the financial sector? Uh, will uh, a banking env environment... Well, a lot of the banks seem to be starting to put stuff out there. I noticed Commonwealth Bank the other week was was, um, was talking about stuff they're putting in the cloud. Um, so I think the the answer is probably going to be yes. Um, and it's going to really depend, Linda, on precisely what security arrangements you're going to put in place. So, you know, the security arrangements, the risk assessment that you do is critical to what you actually do in the cloud. 
So, um, you know, if you do your risk assessment properly, you know exactly where you think the risks are going to be and you can start to put security in place to, uh, to mitigate those risks. And that's really what the aim of this week and next week is about. Identify the risks, figure out how to mitigate them, you know, and then um, because this, this week teaches you to sort of identify where the risks are, next week we look at rating them and then we come back basically to this again to say, okay, now how do we fix it? How do we mitigate against that particular risk? So this security and risk management goes around in a circle together. Um, it's, it's an iterative process. That when you do one, move to the other, come back, move to the other again. So it's, it's a, a continual iteration where you uh, constantly update your, your risk management approach and then um, you know, change the mitigations you put in place. Does that help? Yeah. Certainly. Certainly, and in fact, um, on the on the on the banking thing, uh, Benjamin's just commented saying he's quite sure that NAB, Combank, and Westpac all use AWS. Yeah, I I, I only know I read about Combank, so I wasn't prepared to talk about the others, uh, but I certainly did read about Combank putting some stuff on AWS. That's huge. It's a very tangible example. It's mm. obviously large chunks of the internet run on AWS, but. They're, they're very big local and high risk examples. Yeah. Um, uh, now DG has just asked, uh, which combination of authentication, uh, so if you're talking multi-factor authentication, is proven to be the most secure? That really depends on the context. Um, anything can be broken uh, if you put enough time and resources at it. I mean, um, you know, if you look at some of the defence defence uh, resources, they will use um, literally multi-factor authentication. So you will have uh, a password, uh, a security card that you will insert or, or uh, have a near-field communications device on. Uh, you might have a fingerprint and an iris scan, and possibly a voice print. Um, you know, and then it might record other biometric things as well because you might be standing in a um, in a uh, in a reader that will you know measure your your body shape and size and weight and compare it with the last time that you were there so if you've suddenly you know gone out to McDonald's and and completely gone berserk on the Big Macs um, you might not get back in after lunch you know if you put on too much weight so um, you know it depends it depends I don't think anything or I think anything can possibly be broken given the right, right circumstances, but it's a matter of putting it into the context of what you're trying to protect and looking at what is the best way to reduce the risk of somebody being incorrectly authenticated. So it's always going to depend on the context. Absolutely. Uh, just a, a couple of comments here. Um, Dean said, I, I work for NAB and we use AWS only for hosting static public information at this stage. And that's that's fair enough too. I mean, I'm not sure, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what, what ComBank was doing, but I thought it was for processing information rather than static um, web pages. So I'm not positive yeah. about that. Um, and I'll have to go find it and have a look and I'll see if I can find it so that we can inform everybody in next week's lecture. But um, it was about two or three weeks ago I read it um, and I flicked past it fairly quickly and it was only after I'd killed the page about five or ten minutes later I thought, oh, damn, I should have read that and kept it. Yeah. Um, so I've got to go back and find it again. That would be good. That would be good to read. Uh, he additionally, he says um, to Peter's earlier point about legal obligations, APRA are watching very closely what we are all doing in this space. I can imagine. They would be somewhat interested. Yeah, Kieran actually um, quite poignantly earlier said a similar thing. New APRA rules are going to be different than the, than what they are today. Yeah, well, I mean, the environment's changing. I mean, if you if you look at five years ago, um, you know, anybody in the financial sector, nobody would have considered a move to the cloud, um, except mm. for possibly you know static web pages because it might be cheaper to put those up there than um, than anything else. But any any sort of data security data processing, data storage would all be done in-house um, or in a data centre, uh, an on-premise data centre where you had a fair amount of control and security. 
right? But to throw it, start throwing it up on Amazon or Zure or Google or Oracle or whoever um, is a uh, a seismic shift in the environment. So yes, APRA would be extremely interested in, uh, in exactly what's going on there. Indeed. Um, we'll probably leave it at that just now for, for tonight. Okay. Um, Andrew just says he's published his bit to the forum, so that's good. Thanks Excellent. for that, Andrew. Okay. We'll have a look at that. I'll get you some. Um, anyone else, if you want to jump on even now or tomorrow, um, we'll have some good discussions about a few of these things on the forum. We could probably talk until we fill the, the server up. <laughs> You just throw another S3 instance at it, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Amazon, we need more S3. <laughs> cool. Okay, so thank you very, very much, guys, for attending. I've, uh, I've enjoyed it. I enjoyed the questions again, as always. It's um, it's a great course, and uh, and I really enjoy the the feedback you guys give. It's it's really really good. So. Um, I look forward to answering your questions on the forum. I'm not going to do any tonight, I'll tell you that. I'll give you a chance to, to put your stuff on and then tomorrow I'll start answering questions. And there's a couple I've got to do a bit of research on and then um, we'll get all the questions answered over the next day or two. Anything else, James, that you want to, want to put in before we head off? Um, nothing from me. Okay. Right, just your last point, do the weekly quiz. Do the weekly everyone. quiz. Do the readings. Yep, we've only got one more to go before the final quiz, so yeah, do the quiz. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, James, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Good night.